Hey, church family, I just have to tell you, uh, God has been so good and so faithful to us as a church over the past three and a half months. I have been incredibly proud of this church and the way we have come together. I've been proud of the unity that we've shared despite going so many weeks without gathering together. I've just had a front row seat to see us come together. And I've watched as you have prayed for one another and encouraged one another and you've spurred one another on and you've done it for me too. And I'm proud of the generosity of this church. The faithful giving of this church family has allowed us to not only continue with the work that God has given us to do, but it has allowed us to help all kinds of other churches and ministries who are really struggling during this time. So as an example of that, Just this past week alone, as a church, we were able to give away more than $300,000 towards things um, like helping disadvantaged and vulnerable children in our communities, Um, to helping people who are newly homeless. Some of them have never experienced homelessness before, but, but they're experiencing it now that the moratorium on evictions has come to an end. And we've continued to help restock food pantries in our region, many of which have twice the demand that they would normally have during this season. So I'm just really, I'm just really grateful and humbled by the unity of this church, by the generosity of this church, and and by the efforts that so many of you have made to just stay connected. I mean, right now, right now we have thousands of you gathering in watch parties for Southeast Online. We've had hundreds of groups that have been meeting online through the last three and a half months. I don't think a week goes by where I don't hear a story of someone who's never been to one of our physical locations and and now they're a part of our church family by connecting online. And so in the midst of all kinds of social distancing, we have found ways to love each other and to care for each other and to be there for one another. Um, and I'm encouraged by that. I'm grateful for it, but I am also ready. I am so ready to start gathering back together. And so we're getting ready to do that this next week. I want to talk to you about that. But first, I got to tell you that in the last um, few months, there's a phrase that I just find myself using uh, repeatedly whenever I'm talking about some sort of upcoming plan, like it's a uh, It's a caveat I just feel compelled to put out there whenever I talk about something that might happen in the future. And here's the phrase I find myself using. I'll I'll say this, barring barring any unforeseen circumstances, like here's the plan, here's what I think will happen, barring any unforeseen circumstances, because we live in a world right now that's just changing quickly. And I think all of us could share stories of how plans have changed and dates have changed. And then those dates have changed again. And it's just a good time for us to remember the prayer of serenity. God, help me to accept the things I can't change. Give me the courage to change the things I can and give me the wisdom to know the difference. Because otherwise it doesn't take very long to just feel pretty overwhelmed and stressed out. I mean, there's just so many things right now that we don't have control over, so many things that we can't change. And so what's that mean? It means here's what we do, that we prayerfully make the best decision we can based on the information we have. And if the information changes the next day, it doesn't mean the decision you made the day before was the wrong decision. It just means you've got some uh, new information. It just means that there are some unforeseen contributing factors. And so I want to talk to you about our regathering plan for this coming weekend, Sunday, July 5th, but understand that it might change like this is barring any unforeseen circumstances. So we will begin meeting back together in person at each of our campuses, um, except for our chapel in the woods campus. Um, We hope to regather at our chapel in the woods campus as soon as possible, uh, but We're going to hold off on that for right now. Uh, What I want to make sure you understand is that we know some of you are not yet comfortable with gathering back together in person. Um, That's okay, right? it's, it's, It's okay. You don't need to feel pressure to do that. Some of you 
fall under the category or you're close to someone who falls under the category of medically vulnerable. And we would even encourage you to, to just keep connecting with us online for this, for this season. Depending on your situation, like we understand, it might not be best for you to come back just yet. Um, I know that many of you will keep connecting with us online. You'll keep gathering in smaller groups or neighborhood watch parties. That's awesome. But starting next week, we'll start regathering at our, our campuses. Um, and and we're, we're excited about what that's gonna look like. But I'll just tell you, I wanna be real clear about a few things because it won't look like, and you know this, but still, it won't look like it did before all of this happened. So our services will be on Sunday only uh, for the immediate future. For now, we'll not have any Saturday services. This will give us a chance to see how people come back. It'll allow our staff and volunteers to be ready and ensure that our environments are as safe and as clean as possible, that the experience is the best it can be. Secondly, uh, for the immediate future, we won't be passing communion or offering um, and we won't be handing out bulletins. So the best way to get your information is gonna be to download the Southeast app. If you haven't done that, just go ahead and do it right now. Uh, we're gonna be putting the most up-to-date information through the Southeast app. Uh, the first week of regathering, so July 5th, we will not have any kind of childcare. We wanna give ourselves a week to adjust to some guidelines. We wanna make sure our volunteers are ready to go. The plan is that on the following week, July 12th, we'll have Southeast kids on that weekend from birth through fifth grade. And for now, all campuses, including the Blank and Baker campus, will watch the sermon on video, but everything, worship, everything else will be live at every campus. Um, Sunday service times are not necessarily the same as they, they were before all of this, and they're different at different campuses. So just make sure you go online for the most up-to-date information. Um, you, you know this, but we are going to great lengths to make sure that we provide uh, the most clean and sanitized environment that we possibly can. And we're working to align with CDC guidelines, but look, it's gonna be similar to what you would experience in other like public areas. Uh, so we won't be policing all of those things. And if you feel uncomfortable, then I would, just, I would just encourage you to stay at home until you feel more comfortable. When you're ready, we'll be ready for you. But I... I am excited for us to be meeting back together. Um, my family and I have been overwhelmed by your prayers, by your encouragement uh, during this time. I, I, I just want you to know that if you're a part of this church, you are not a part of a perfect church, but you are a part of a church that is filled with faith and hope and love and stands solidly on the rock of Jesus. Um, a few days into this COVID situation, uh, when everything was starting to be canceled and it looked like we were gonna be shutting down the economy for some time to some degree, and it looked like the medical system was gonna be at least somewhat overwhelmed, I, I was praying and asking God, God, what, what is the message that you would have for your people during this time? And if I were being honest, I prayed asking God to reveal that, but I thought I already knew it. Like I thought the message God would have me share with people during this time would be a message of comfort and courage. Like that seems to be the appropriate message for a time when everyone is struggling and, and when there's a lot of um, suffering. So I thought comfort and courage, that's gonna be the message. But that's not the image that God brought to mind. Instead, the image that God brought to my mind is an image that God used when he spoke to his people in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. If you have your Bible, if you have a Bible app there with you, let's go ahead and open it to uh, Jeremiah chapter two. Jeremiah chapter two. Now this comes at a time that was difficult for God's people then. Um, it comes at a time where they had prayed for God to rescue them from some struggling and some suffering but God wanted them to deal with some areas of their life first because they had got caught up in idolatry. The Northern kingdom of Israel, um, as a result of idolatry, worshiping false gods, uh, had been taken captive by the Assyrians and God calls a priest named Jeremiah to be his prophet, to say to the people, look, 
You're asking to be rescued, but there's some things that need your attention here. Jeremiah was a young dude. He was like uh, probably in his early 20s, but God gives him a heavy message to give to his people. So Jeremiah 2, starting in verse 8, God says to the people through Jeremiah, therefore I bring charges against you again. Like this isn't the first time we've had this conversation. We, we've, we've talked about this before. And in the Old Testament, we see that there was this um, sin cycle where the people would um, start to give their affection and their attention to false gods. And then life would get hard and they would realize the false gods they put their hope in are powerless and they could do nothing to save them. And, and then they would cry out to God. And God's like, yeah, we've done this before. And it's the same conversation. And so God says to the people through Jeremiah, I'm gonna bring a couple of charges against you. And here's what we read. My people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. This is a, a big deal. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns, cisterns that cannot hold water. And so I don't think this is the message that the people were wanting to hear. Like life is hard and they're hurting and they're hoping God will say, I'm so sorry about what you're going through. Let me, let me pull you out of that. Let me fix your situation and, and solve your problems. But instead the message God has for the people is here's what I have against you. You have rejected me and you've turned to worthless idols. And, and so there's this image that um, God uses as a metaphor so that the people will under, understand. And the metaphor is, hey, you've, you've got this fresh and living water. It's available to you. It's right there. It's, it's right in front of you. But you're, you're digging these broken and worthless wells when you have this fresh water available. And they're spending all kinds of, uh, the metaphor would be they're spending all kinds of time and energy digging. They're digging these wells that give them nothing. They're digging hard, they're digging deep, but they're digging for nothing. And they would have understood this metaphor because cistern, cisterns or wells were an important part of everyday life in Israel during Jeremiah's time. In fact, thousands of them have, have since been uncovered by archeologists. Uh, more than half of the year, it rarely ever rained so that people in those days would dig cisterns and they would line those cisterns with bricks and plaster to hold the water. But, but it wasn't a great system because they were always breaking. They were always losing water. And even when they, they didn't break, the, the water at the bottom of the cistern would become stagnant and the supply was often inadequate. And, and so they'd have to go and they'd have to, they'd have to build another one. And so when God gives them this metaphor, they immediately understand it. Like they understand how ridiculous it would be for anyone to do the hard work of, of digging out a cistern when there is a spring of living rot water right there. Like why, would, why would you do that? Why would you give so much time and attention to digging for, for nothing? And so that's the question. That's the question, just to stop and ask yourself now. Before all of this, what wells were you trying to draw water from? When you were thirsty, what cisterns would you go to? Because it would be incredibly sad if we went through all of this and we just go back. We just find ourselves digging at the same old wells. We know they don't hold water. If these last few months have shown us anything, it, it's shown that so much of what we put our hope in doesn't hold water. And I don't wanna just go back to that. I don't wanna just go back to building the same systems and trying to draw water from the same old wells. And so what I hope we can do in these next few minutes together is identify the, system, the cisterns that don't hold water and just determine together, I'm, I'm not gonna just, I'm not gonna go back to digging. Um, this imagery, of course, 
is an imagery that helps us better understand idolatry. Now, look, I I know idolatry just doesn't seem very relevant to us today. We read about it in scripture. It feels like this antiquated issue. Um, And yet, here's the thing. If you read, if you read, through scripture, it is the most discussed problem in the Bible. Like it's the number one sin problem in the Bible. But we, we tend to skip over it because it, it doesn't seem like something, at least in our modern day Western world, that is much of an issue. I, don't, I mean, I don't know anybody who, who bows down and worships golden images or carved statues. But what is an idol? An idol, an idol is anything that serves as God's competition. It's anything, or or for that matter, it's anyone we look to to do for us what God wants to do for us. And if that's what an idol is, then I think it's safe to say that God has probably never had more competition. Because while we may not focus our eyes on a carved serpent, and we give a lot of attention to a, a small screen, 